Welcome to our webinar, Understanding the New Requirements of EN 55022 for Europe. Thank you for joining us today. This webinar is being given by MET Laboratories. MET is a leader in the testing of electrical and electronic equipment for environmental hardiness, product safety, electromagnetic compatibility, and energy efficiency. MET operates world-class labs in Baltimore, Maryland, Santa Clara and Union City, California, Austin, Texas, and also runs operations in China, Korea, and Taiwan. This webinar will run 20 to 30 minutes with an additional 15 minutes for questions and answers. Due to the number of registrants, all attendees will have their phones muted. If you have a question, please type it in the questions area of your GoToWebinar control panel. We will attempt to answer all questions at the end. If you are having technical difficulties, you can contact us the same way, and we will try to resolve it quickly. Just a quick note on other upcoming events. Later this month, on May 24th, MET is hosting an Electronic Equipment Reliability and Testing Seminar in Austin, Texas. Then on June 8th, MET is co-hosting an EMC Design and Testing Seminar in Union City, California. You can register for these events on our website at www.metlabs.com. Today's webinar is being presented by Assad Bajwa, Director of MET's EMC Lab. At this point, I will hand over the presentation to Assad. Uh, thanks, Barnaby. Hello, everyone. Uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, EN 55022. Uh, the main focus would be on the addition of 1 gigahertz to 6 gigahertz uh, high-frequency radiative emissions. Uh, I'm going to start with a brief outline of my presentations. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the additional EMC requirements there. Uh, we'll, we'll look at and compare the FCC high-frequency requirement, which goes from 1 gigahertz to 40 gigahertz, and compare the FCC test method to the CISPR-16 test method. And then we also have a, a brief discussion about uh, uh, the FCC test method radiation from uh, NCC 63.4 version 2003 compared to the 2009 version. Then a brief comparison of uh, NSA, which is normalized site attenuation, uh, to the VSWR method of uh, uh, chamber validation for uh, new CISPR requirements. Uh, the new CISPR 22 or EN 55022 came out in 2006. Uh, soon after, uh, they released the amendment A1, which which came out in 2007. With that amendment, uh, they made it uh, they, they made the requirement from one gigahertz to six gigahertz uh, part of the document. Uh, even though the testing requirement is one gigahertz to six gigahertz, uh, the standard refers to CISPR 16 for chamber validation or calibration. Uh, where the calibration could be done up to 18 gigahertz. Uh, having that said, this test method differs from totally dif totally differs from the other methods being used in the industry today. Uh, primarily, up till this point, the high frequency requirements were coming either from some of the military specification or avionics specification. On the commercial side, the above 1 gigahertz testing requirements were only spelled out in FCC Part 15, Subpart B, where the requirement was based on the highest clock frequency. If the clock was greater than 108 megahertz, uh, then uh, above 1 gigahertz radio emission testing would be required as high as uh, 40 gigahertz, depending on the EUC clock. Uh, the CISPR 22, the new edition, is using a similar approach. Uh, the standard says, uh, above 1 gigahertz testing, it would be required only if the clock frequency of the EUT uh, is greater than uh, 1 gigahertz. However, uh, it, it puts a limit uh, to the maximum emission to 6 gigahertz compared to the 40 gigahertz for 
uh, FCC Part 15. Uh, at the same time, at the same time, uh, the CISPR document refers to CISPR 16.1-4, edition two, uh, as far as what are the valid test sites. And in the next few slides, I'm going to focus on uh, what are the what are the options as the valid test sites where CISPR above one gigahertz radiation emission testing could be done, and what are the methods out there to uh, validate those sites. Uh, for the labs, there have been a lot of challenges to get those existing chambers, which were either 10 meter, 5 meter, or 3 meter, uh, which were meant originally for uh, the radiation emission testing from 30 to 1 gig, uh, to make them worthy of this for 16, so that above 1 gigahertz testing could be performed in those uh, very chambers. A brief note there. Uh, since CISPR 22 came out in 2006, uh, 2006 with the amendment of 2007, uh, the the ETSI documents, which is very very similar to the CISPR 22 document, uh, basically the ETSI documents call CISPR 22 for the emission, ready emission, conducting emission, and also the the conducting emission on telecom port as a reference document. Uh, the latest version of ETSI up to recently was version 1.4.1. And that version did not uh, address the above one gigahertz testing. However, the new document, which was released recently, uh, the version 1.5.1, uh, is referencing to the amendment A1 of CISPR 22. Therefore, above one gigahertz testing has become part of ETSI document, even though it's not mandatory today. Uh, a similar note for uh, EN55022 itself. Uh, the above one gigahertz testing requirement will become mandatory uh, as of October this year. Uh, going back to going back to the test sites, uh, for the folks who are familiar with FCC Part 15 uh, high frequency testing. Uh, the FCC Part 15 is relying on NCC 63.4. Uh, the older version was 2003. The new version, which is 2009, FCC has indicated uh, as of now they will accept both documents. However, the 2003 version did not specify a specific calibration method for above 1 gigahertz, whereas for 30 megahertz to 1 gigahertz, they are very well established calibration or validation method, which we normally refer to as normalized site attenuation. A very, very similar method is for the CISPR 22, which is coming from uh, CISPR 16 1.4. Now with this new requirement, uh, this new requirement of uh, above 1 gigahertz for CISPR, uh, the standard is referencing to a test site which would simulate the free space, uh, or in other words, there would be no reflection from the wall, from the ceiling, from the floor. The biggest challenge there was to minimize the reflections coming from the floor. At the same time, depending upon the quality of the chamber, uh, depending upon the quality of the absorber being used, uh, as I said, that uh, the challenge was to make the existing chamber work. And the existing chamber would normally have the absorber, which would be good typically only up to one gigahertz. And beyond one gigahertz, their loss characteristics will uh, drastically vary. So therefore, for most of the lab, they, they had to go through a significant retrofit or upgrade to make those chambers worthy of doing uh, new CISPR requirements. The, the, the calibration method or the chamber which we're calling is uh, requires or refers to as free space. Uh, why we call it free space? Uh, standard says there should be no reflection. Uh, an existing chamber can be modified. Uh, the absorber can be placed on the floor. Absorber can be modified on the ceiling and on the walls. Another challenge there was, another challenge there was that most of the existing chambers would have selected locations on the walls where absorber were placed. Uh, that would significantly add to the reflections coming from the wall. So in many cases, lab would, labs would have to have added more rows of absorbers 
from the bottom level to three to four feet high to minimize the reflection coming from the wall itself. Now, in the next few slides, I'm going to uh, talk about how this free space calibration method works. This particular slide indicates this particular slide indicates how in a typical chamber uh, lab will have to put the absorber within the EUT, which is sitting on a 40, uh, which is sitting on a 80 centimeter high table, and between the receive antenna, which is uh, three meter away from the uh, your measurement geometry or the EUT, if you want to call that. The the trick there is to see is you will have to have absorber between the turntable and the receive antenna. You would have to add enough absorber that your reflection is minimized enough that VSWR is less than 6 dB. Another trick, which I will explain in a few seconds, is that you end up putting absorber right where the, the table ends. Basically, that is the area where your turntable is. Now, uh, for the folks who are familiar with how the testing works, the turntable have to rotate, and when the turn <coughs> excuse me, and when the turntable rotates, that would mean the absorber sitting on the turntable will move. So to deal with that, the only possible way to do that is to have absorber all on the turntable around the EUT. Okay, uh, I'm gonna next move to the site validation. CISPR 16.1.4 section 8 uh, defines the site validation method which is based on VSWR. Uh, standard specifies two different uh, techniques. One is the SV, site VSWR method, the other one is called reciprocal site VSWR method. Let's explore both these methods. Uh, this slide shows uh, the mathematics behind the site VSWR. I have added there for the interested, interested uh, viewers so that they have a better understanding how in a chamber the reflection is, uh, the VSWR is computed. By definition, VSWR or voltage standing wave ratio is a ratio of the maximum field to the minimum field in the chamber. Uh, the semi inequate chamber, which we are talking about for calibrating according to the free space requirement. Uh, just imagine this is the semi inequate chamber is a huge cavity or a cavity resonator. When RF field is introduced into a cavity resonator due to the reflections from the walls, from the floor, from the ceiling, RF energy will interact back and forth, back and forth, the way it would do in a cavity resonator. And due to the uh, due to the uh, vector addition and vector subtraction of the signal at various physical points uh, in the measurement geometry, uh, there will be maximas and minimas uh, due to the reflection present in the chamber. So, depending on what location the EUT is placed and or what location the receive antenna is placed, if the reflections are significant, the results could be way, way off compared to if there were no reflections. Therefore, the emphasis here is to do additional effort to minimize those reflections. And uh, as I said, the ratio of the maximum field to the minimum field in the measurement geometry is your, uh, your BSWR. And if you convert that into a logarith logarithmic numbers, then the field measured uh, in dB microvolts uh, per meter minus the field minimum field measured in dB microvolts per meter would be your VSWR. Uh, next slide gives you the acceptable criteria. In linear terminology, uh, the acceptable criteria uh, acceptable ratio is two to one. And in, uh, in dB terminology, uh, the, all the reflection should be less than 6 dBs 
for a site to be an accredited site for uh, according to CISPR 16.1.4. Okay, uh, the way this calibration is done is very involved procedure. It requires a lot of skill and knowledge how uh, the whole procedure works. Uh, the test equipment used is based on a linearly polarized receive antenna uh, like the one which is used in the lab environment for uh, above one gigahertz testing every day. Uh, a common example would be the MCO 3115 or a similar antenna uh, which is a double ridged horn antenna covers the frequency range from one gigahertz to 18 gigahertz. The transmit antenna is the one which is a specialized antenna. Uh, it is a very small dipole which would cover the frequency range 1 to 18 gigahertz. As the dipole by definition have a very small uh, bandwidth, so special techniques are applied with the construction of this antenna to make it a wide band. If you look at the physical antenna recommended by the standard for this testing, instead of instead of regular uh, uh, dipole, it has two small cones on both sides. Those cones help increase the bandwidth of this antenna. Finally, uh, you need to have a, either a network analyzer or a combination of a network an a spectrum analyzer and a signal source. Uh, the recommended method is network analyzer because uh, due to the, uh, the synchronization, the, uh, the phase synchronization, the results are a lot more accurate. However, uh, the setup with the signal source and a spectrum analyzer is also acceptable. Then finally, the, the most tricky part is to uh, the ability to accurately measure the position. And I will explain that in the next slide, what exactly uh, do, do I mean by that? I'm going to skip this slide for one second. I want to jump right to the physical geometry on how the calibration takes place. This diagram is an illustration. This, this diagram is an illustration of the turntable and the receive antenna. On the turntable, I'm going to use a pointer to indicate where my cursor is. Uh, you identify four locations, right, left, center, and the front. And at each location, uh, there are six points. And, and the very first point at the beginning is what we call as a reference point, which is marked as, uh, in green color uh, at each location to identify it. For example, I'm at the front position on my turntable. And uh, the green circle is my uh, reference point. I will have to take six measurements at each location. Uh, first location at the reference point, then I'm going to go uh, two centimeter back, take another reading, go 10 centimeter back, another reading, 18 centimeter back, another reading, 30 centimeter, 40 centimeter, and repeat the same process on all the test, all the four test locations. Uh, say, let's go back to the front position. I took my reading at the front, very front at the reference point. Then I took my consecutive readings at the distances I mentioned a few seconds ago. For each reading, for each reading, theoretically speaking, if there are no reflections present, uh, by adding the distance correction formula, all these points should yield the same result under the assumption under the assumption that the receive antenna is in the far field in the far field uh, the mathematical relation between the fields is 1 over r and therefore the the distance correction formula which is uh, 20 log of d1 to d2 uh, holds very very accurately now if there were reflections, which are always there because typically floor doesn't have any absorbers or floor it does have absorber, it covers a small segment of the space between the UT and the receive antenna. And therefore, 
when you apply the disinfection disinfection formula, our results will vary. And as long as by applying the disinfection formula, all the points yield the results which are within 6 dB, uh, that point will still consider meeting the requirement. To re-emphasize, let me repeat the process one more time. Uh, we will take a reading at reference point. We will repeat the process at each consecutive point at the distance specified. We will apply the distance correction formula. And then we will, from these six measurements, determine the highest emission. And we will determine the lowest emission. In assuming all these readings are in dB, microvolts, or dBm, or whatever, uh, the difference of the maximum emission out of these six points to the lowest or minimum emission would give you your v site VSWR in dB. So the same process will be repeated on all those points, right, left, and in the center. And based on that, uh, it will be determined whether your sites meet the requirement. Now, how many heights this process has to be repeated? Uh, it has to be done at 1 meter. It has to be done at 1.5 meter for both polarization, vertical, horizontal. And the highest point where this measurement needs to be done uh, will be based on what, are, what is the maximum size of the EUT you would plan to test at your facility. If you are testing a rack mount equipment, which is 7 feet tall, and you would plan to have a cable which are about 1 feet high from the rack height, then your, you will be better off going to as high as 2.5 meter. But again, it really depends on what a certain facility plan to do, uh, uh, what sort of EUTs they want to test. Uh, let's go back to our slide we skipped in between. Uh, we talked about the we talked about the number of positions which I mentioned already. Uh, we talked about the test volume, which will be your uh, bottom measurement point, which is one meter to all the way up on the top. Uh, that will be based on the height of the UT, uh, six positions, and then we apply the distance correction formula to correct that. I'm going to go back to the setup picture which I shown a uh, few minutes earlier to explain the level of the complexity uh, the folks have to go through when they are performing this calibration. I'm going to use this uh, arrow to indicate uh, during the calibration process, this table won't be there present. Instead of that, we will have the dipole antenna sitting at the four different locations, as I explained on the diagram, uh, at the front, right, left, and in the center. And at each location, you will have to take six different readings, which are spaced by small distances. For example, you are at reference point, and as I mentioned earlier, you go two centimeter back, you go 10 centimeter back, you go 18, 30, and 40. Now, the trick is you already have the absorbers on the turntable. And with the absorber sitting on the turntable, you have to make an accurate distance measurement. And what you do is you remove the absorber from the turntable. You put your positioning device, which is generally a plumb line. Uh, some people use the... Uh, uh, old style plumb line, some people would use the laser plumb line, Wh whichever works better, uh, people are welcome to use. But the complexity remains there with removing the absorber, pointing out the, the exact location, and putting the absorber back on, and so many variables that it really remains a question how accurate your physical position was. And it's extremely, extremely critical that the distances are measured with great accuracy with a minor movement of one to two millimeter could add to inaccurate results or could indicate a false failure or a false compliance to the requirement. Therefore, I cannot, em I cannot emphasize more 
that it's extremely, extremely important that these distances are measured with the great accuracy. Uh, now we can continue on to the next slide. Uh, we already covered all the six distances. Uh, I mentioned earlier, I'm going to step back to the slide one more time, that from reference point to each consecutive point, when you take a reading, you would have to add the distance fraction formula. This slide gives you that formula and explains what exactly it means. You are taking a raw reading, which is indicated as MNOPQ, plus 20 log of your distance from the receive antenna to the point in question over the reference distance as it's indicated in the diagram on the previous slide. And when you apply this formula, you are correcting your reading at each consecutive point with respect to the reference point and should there be no reflections, should there be no reflections, uh, your results will be practically the same. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> we covered how the site validation needs to be done for free space method for above one gigahertz testing. This particular slide shows what happens uh, when a measurement is taken for the given frequency range for a site which would, which would qualify for free space compared to which doesn't qualify with the free space? Uh, to, to, to keep it simple, uh, generally speaking, to make a site qualify for the free space, you will have to put, you, would, you wouldn't have any choice than to put absorbers on the floor. Uh, it will be it will be a very rare incident. In some cases, you may not have to put the absorber on the floor. Generally speaking, you always end up putting absorber on the floor between the EUT and your receive antenna. So this uh, plot indicates or shows the comparison between the results with the absorber, without the absorber, and the absorber, when I say absorber, the absorber were placed to make our site uh, meet the requirement of the free space. Uh, the blue line on the screen, and I hope you guys could see that uh, the color difference, uh, is are the results with the absorbers, uh, without the absorbers. The blue line is without the absorber. The, the purple pinkish line is with absorbers. Uh, and the red is the, uh, the CISPR class B average limit. Now, the point to note is that from the frequency range 1 gigahertz to 3 gigahertz, uh, it clearly indicates that with the absorber place, there was significant reduction in the, in the data measures, in the data measures. And at 2 gigahertz, the variation was relatively low. Theoretically speaking, one would expect the results here to be even of the same order of magnitude at 1 gigahertz and at 3, 3 gigahertz. However, the results are close to the emissions as without absorber uh, because the site source we use was not really a point source. Should we have access to a theoretical point source, the results would be very consistent from 1 to 2 to 3 gigahertz. Uh, that is one aspect, what happens with the, when the absorber are placed. Uh, in the next slide, I'm going to jump back to how the limit for new CISPA requirement compare with the FCC limit. Okay. The red, the red line on this slide is FCC average limit for class B. Pink line is the CISPR 22, the CISPR 22 class B limit. Uh, the blue line is the CISPR 22, the peak limit. So between the red and pink, 
both are average limit. <clears throat> point I'm trying to make here is that point I'm trying to make here is that look at the band from one gigahertz to three gigahertz where the CISPR limit goes back to from 50 giga, from 50 dB microvolts per meter to uh, 54 dB microvolts per meter. The part I'm trying to make here is that for the folks who have done testing in the past to the older version of CISPR 22, where uh, above one gigahertz testing was not required, and at the same time they did the testing for FCC Part 15 subpart B, and their products passed FCC Part 15 subpart B. However, their margins were either close or at least between the band, which goes from 50 dB microvolts to 54 dB microvolts per meter. And now they want to, now after October, they still would have those products placed on the market. They are not discontinuing those products. They would have to go back to the test labs and redo the one gig to six gigahertz for CISPR according to the free space method. What that means, your limit is about four dB below the FCC limit. And if your results were close to the 54 or above 50, then it is certainly a point of concern and the manufacturer should look into their design and review their product to see if anything needs to be done to make sure or any modification need to be done to the product to make sure product would still comply when they will be uh, when it will become mandatory to do the testing after October of 2011 so so again to reemphasize for the folks who have passed in the uh, in the past passed the FCC above 1 gigahertz in the past they may run into a little difficulty if their margin was not greater than 4 dB, they will have to do some additional homework to make sure in this frequency band from 1 gigahertz to 3 gigahertz uh, that they modify the products in a way they could still get compliance and they still continue to uh, place those products on, uh, on, on the marketplace after October of this year when above 1 gigahertz testing becomes mandatory not only for CISPR 22, uh, meaning for Europe, uh, for many other nations like uh, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, uh, Australia, New Zealand, these, these requirements are going to become mandatory fairly very, very soon. Uh, with that, uh, we are pretty much nearing the end of this presentation. I'm going to take just a few uh, more minutes to talk about another point, which is the comparison of FCC requirement versus the CISPR method. Uh, FCC historically never specified a test side validation method for above one gigahertz. Uh, below one gigahertz, FCC relied on NCC 63.4 2004, uh, which specified the normalized side attenuation method. Since FCC is accepting the NCC 63.4 version 2009, actually they are accepting both for now. Uh, the 2009 version, they are doing an attempt to harmonize the requirement with CISPR 16.1.4. If you look at the wording in NCC 63.4 2009, Regarding above one gigahertz testing method, the standard says that uh, a test site similar to what is required for CISPR 16.1.4 could be used for above one gigahertz testing or a test site where you have absorber placed between the EUT and the receive antenna uh, to minimize the reflection could also be used. Then they specify the height of the absorber, et cetera, et cetera. I wish they have given a more clear guideline, but even then, it is, 
it is fairly quite clear, uh, although there are a few points a little bit ambiguous, that they are saying a site similar to CISPR 16.1.4 could be used for SEC testing. What are the implications? The implication is this. In the past, when a manufacturer goes to a lab for uh, high-frequency emission testing, they would have to do two runs of the emission testing. One for SCC, which would be done without absorber on the floor, and a second run with the absorber on the floor to uh, satisfy the need of uh, CISPR-16 method. Since FCC is now accepting the 2009 version, therefore labs can just do a one run, and with that one single run, uh, they can satisfy the need of both these standards. Uh, that's pretty much all I have to say about this test map, uh, the new requirement for CISPR-22, uh, above one gigahertz. Uh, we could spend a little bit more time on this slide to talk about uh, uh, more about the specifics which came from uh, FCC for according to NCC 63.4. Uh, however, I'm going to uh, conclude my presentation with the final comment that I strongly advise the manufacturer of the product uh, who plan to continue placing their products on the market after October of this year uh, to go back, reevaluate their test results if they did the FCC testing at that point uh, above one gigahertz and see what are the margins they achieved. And if they did not get margins beyond four dB at least, then they should look into uh, the possibility of uh, going back to a lab to have their products re-evaluated to ensure uh, they would still comply while they still have time, uh, there, there's se several months to October uh, before it will become mandatory and it becomes a big issue. There still is time to address this method if in some cases there are concerns where the margins are lower. Uh, with that, I conclude my presentation. Uh, like Barnaby mentioned, if you folks have any questions, please uh, do uh, type in your questions, and we'll try to address your question as much as we can in the time given. Uh, Barnaby, I'm going to give the control back to you. Yes, thank you, Asad. Uh, th this webinar has been recorded and will be available for on-demand viewing on metlabs.com. Now we will go into our Q&A period. If you have a question, please type it in the questions area of your control panel. For all relevant questions, we will read the question, then give a verbal answer. You can go ahead, Asad. We seem to have lost Assad for a moment. Please, please hold on, and uh, we'll 
try and get him back in as quickly as possible. Uh, my apologies. I'm back. Uh, I hope you guys can hear me again. Okay. So the first question is, what is the effective date for uh, mandatory compliance with uh, Amendment A1 of 2007? At the moment, the date of enforcement is October 1, uh, 2011. The second question is, what determines the maximum clock frequencies? Uh, the maximum clock frequencies could be the clocks associated with your processing devices, uh, your chipsets, and or the clocks on your data buses or the interface ports. Uh, another question is, when, when I tried to purchase the A1, I was unable to buy it from DSI. Uh, Instead, I was able to buy, uh, only to buy A2, is A2 much different? Uh, technically speaking, there are hardly any differences. Uh, as far as uh, this free space requirement is concerned, there are no differences. Uh, the next question is, what depends the maximum frequency? OK. Uh, the question is, does it make a difference if a clock frequency is internal to a chip or it's external on the board? Uh, you will find two school of thoughts. One school of thought insists the clock frequencies inside the chip uh, are of lesser concern because they are deep inside the processor. Uh, however, the second school of thought would insist that the clock frequency should be based on uh, all the clock frequencies being used in the product regardless uh, it's within the chip and or the board. Uh, my part is more closely to the second viewpoint where all the clocks within the device should be considered. Okay, uh, the next question I have is uh, are products already placed on the market would be grandfathered or would they be required to go through testing after October 2011? The answer to this question is there, there is always, there, there's some misunderstanding on this grandfather, grandfathering concept. The basic rule by the European Union is at any given time a product placed in market should satisfy the applicable compliance standards. Now, if a product was tested to uh, CISPR 22 1998 version and you are still placing that product on market today even though you didn't modify your product and the new requirement is CISPR 22 2006 A1 by law you are required to make sure your product still satisfy the latest standard available the time you have the product on the marketplace. What that means is you will have to go back, uh, review your documentation to see if your self -de declaration uh, correctly reflects the current status and or in some cases, you have to go back and repeat the testing. Uh, in other words, if you did not perform above one gigahertz testing with your original testing program, you will have to repeat the testing now after October of this year. Uh, another question is uh, the 108 megahertz oscillator oscillation frequency. Uh, Uh, the 108 megahertz requirement is very, very similar to the way it is with FCC. Uh, above 1 gigahertz testing is required only if your oscillator frequency is or your clock frequencies are above 1 gigahertz. Uh, the next question is the above one gigahertz scan is not needed for FCC. 
uh, the answer is it's not correct. FCC rules follow the similar principle where if your clock frequency is greater than 108 megahertz, you have to do uh, you have to uh, test your product uh, above one gigahertz, and you will go as high as depending on uh, your clock frequency. And there's a table in FCC Part 15 uh, which determines how high you need to go. Uh, one question is. Uh, could you please explain the formula for uh, the distance correction factor? Uh, the answer is that uh, basically to determine the VSWR, you would you are taking a reading at you are taking a reading at a reference point. Then you are taking a reading at few distances within your test volume backward, starting from your reference point backwards to within your test volume. And you want to see when you take a reading at those points and correlate those readings to your reference point. Uh, when I use the word correlate, what it means is you will apply the distance correction formula, which is based on D1 over D2, uh, meaning if I'm taking a reading at 40 centimeter, I can convert the results taken at 40 centimeter by applying the distance correction formula to my reference point. Uh, it's very, very similar to if you did a testing at 3 meter distance and you want to compare your results with 10 meter distance, so you will apply the distance correction formula, which will be based on 20 log of D1 over D2, which is 3 over 10, and it comes out to be 10.46. So on a similar approach, you will apply the distance correction formula and correct your reading. And when you compare after applying this formula, you will expect at a very good site, they will be practically the same. However, if there are reflections, the results would vary. And that's exactly the goal is to see that when you look back within your volume, that all the points within the volume, the measurement volume, have the the, the standing waves less than uh, such that the VSWR is less than 6 dB. <clears throat> okay. Uh, there is one question, that uh, a certain lab would not put the absorber on the floor under the notion that uh, uh, that represents the worst case. Uh, in all honesty, my opinion is this is an uh, incorrect assumption because, uh, because the, the way the uh, VSWR works, the RF energy could add constructively and RF energy could add destructively, meaning the, the way RF signals are added, it's not a mathematical uh, summation or subtraction. Let me reemphasize. The way the RF signals add or sub subcontract, it is not a mathematical addition or subtraction. It is a vector addition and or subtraction. And the assumption that without absorber the results will always be worst case is inaccurate because uh, if the signals are, if the distances are such that the signals are adding in a way that it's a, it, it's a destructive or negative uh, negation of the signals, you could see the results lot less than what they would really be in the real life. Therefore, you could get false positive results. And if you look at the new uh, NCC 63.4 document 2009, it specifies that you should use absorber on the floor between the device or, or IUT and your receive antenna. So I would highly recommend uh, that 
data absorber uh, placed in between the EUT and the receive antenna unless unless it could be shown with the VSWR calibration method absorbers are not needed, which is very, very unlikely. Uh, that pretty much covers all the questions I have received. Uh, I'm going to give the control back to Barnaby. I uh, do appreciate your time, and thanks for uh, listening to me today. Thank you. In a couple days, we will send a follow-up email that will include a link to the recorded webinar as well as a special offer.